The artifact is 150,000 years old. It's made of an artificial metal we have been unable to identify. There is a message scratched on the front. What does it say? This is a horror podcast. Consider yourselves warned. Pseudopod, episode 631, January 18th, 2019. This week's story, The Last Sailing of the Henry Charles Morgan in Six Pieces of Scrimshaw, 1841, by A.C. Wise. Hey everyone, welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast. I'm Alistair, your host, and this week's story comes to us from the magnificent A.C. Wise. A.C., much like Trisha last week, is one of those authors whose work all demands attention and is a frequent flyer in these parts. We'll put the link to their official Escape Artists page in the show notes. Go, click, listen, discover just how amazing they are. Your reader for this week is, well, me. When Alistair Stewart is not hosting Pseudopod and Escapepod, or co-running Escape Artists Inc., he's professionally enthusiastic about genre fiction on the internet at places like Tor.com, Barnes & Noble, The Guardian, Uncanny Magazine, Sci-Fi Now, and his own blog, The Man of Words. He's an any nominated tabletop RPG writer for his work on Doctor Who Adventures in Time and Space. His other RPG writing includes Star Trek, The Laundry Files, Primeval, Victoriana, All Flesh Must Be Eaten, NEW, Chill, and the recently completed After the War, co-created with Jason Peter. Basically, he has a playbook for any variety of invasion you could name. He lives in the UK with the love of his life and their ever-expanding herd of microphones. Follow him on Twitter, at Alistair Stewart, or at his blog, The Man of Words. Alternately, sign up for his weekly newsletter, The Full Lid. A free weekly download of pop culture enthusiasm, previous issues have included everything from ketchup recipes to the common ground shared by Frank Castle and the passages Brad Wolgast. The link is in the show notes. So, without further ado, get ready to take a trip around a very unusual kind of exhibit. Because I have a story for you. And if you look closely, you can see it's true. The Last Sailing of the Henry Charles Morgan in Six Pieces of Scrimshaw, 1841, by A.C. Wise. 1. Sperm Whale Tooth, Lamp Black. The first scene depicted is the whaling ship Henry Charles Morgan beset by a storm. The waves are stylized curls, the wind traced as spirals battering the masts and tearing the sails. A series of dots arranged diagonally across the image stand in for rain. The lamp black is worked most deeply into the ocean, bearing the ship up and tossing it around. The ship itself is second in darkness, with the spirals of wind touched most lightly, giving them a ghostly feel. Spaces of blankness within the waves suggest the presence of hands, shapes of absence rather than definitively carved things. It is possible the artist meant to metaphorically represent the storm. The ocean is a malignant force actively trying to pull the whalers from the ship and cause them to drown. 2. Sperm Whale Tooth, Red Sealing Wax This piece depicts the immediate aftermath of the storm that struck the Henry Charles Morgan. In contrast to the high, vicious curves of the first, the waves here are represented by small triangles, with concave sides indicating the water calmed. The Henry Charles Morgan is clearly damaged, sails limp and torn, the mainmast cracked and listing. Debris lies scattered upon the waves. In the forefront, two human figures float, face down. A third figure hangs limply from a rope, secured around his chest and under his arms, as three of his fellows haul him back aboard. The artist took care to include the minute detail of water dripping from the man's toes. Again, the absence-marked shape of a hand is suggested, reaching after the half-drowned man as he is pulled from the sea. Perhaps this is meant to represent the sea's jealousy and its unsated hunger, despite the lives already claimed. The red hue of the sealing wax calls to mind waves, darkened by blood. 3. Right Whale Baleen The third piece shows the Henry Charles Morgan repaired, but becalmed. 
The water is not depicted at all, the absence of water underscoring the utter stillness. The natural arc of the baleen is used to good effect, suggesting the vast sweep of sky above the ship. The artist has taken care to illuminate the scene with a scatter of stars etched into the baleen in the faintest crescent of a moon. It seems likely the choice of material for this particular piece was made specifically to represent a scene taking place at night in the midst of the becalmed sea. The Henry Charles Morgan lies still, yet motion is suggested in a singular figure, scaling the ship's hull. The figure is shown from the waist up only, legs swallowed by the invisible water. The arm muscles stand out with the effort of the climb, while the tips of the fingers taper to points fine enough to suggest claws sunk into the wood. A faint pattern of scales, so slightly drawn it might be missed, covers the skin. Ropes of wet hair hang over the figure's shoulders. Seen only from behind, the figure's sex is indeterminate. To stretch the metaphor applied to the earlier pieces, here the artist gives physical form to the whaler's anxiety. Even though their ship has been repaired, they cannot leave. The sea still has a grip on them, creeping up the very boards, intent on doing them harm. 4. Three joined right whale vertebrae, collectively known as the vertebrae triptych, Vertigree. Even though three separate scenes are depicted on each of the three bones, the piece, taken together, is counted as one entry in the series. The first bone shows a group of three men. One holds a lantern aloft and finely drawn rays of light illuminate a fourth figure crouched in front of them. It is reasonable to assume this is the same figure depicted on the baleen climbing the ship. The figure is shown in profile, the sex, still indeterminate with much of the body hidden behind a wet mass of hair. The features in evidence are thin haunches, accentuated by the crouching position, jutting hip bones, wiry arms. The muscles still in evidence, though less defined, and fingers splayed upon the deck to show a hint of webbing between each. The figure is poised to spring. The expressions on the faces of the three whalers are, if not identical, at least similar. Each clearly shows a man frozen in his own private moment of surprise, terror, or disgust. The second vertebrae shows the moment after an attack. The lantern lies on its side, projecting rays of light upward. The man holding it now clutches his face. The darkness of his hands is emphasized, suggesting blood from a wound he is trying to staunch. The other two men are sketched more lightly, having withdrawn a pace and putting their wounded fellow between themselves and the creature. The creature itself now crouches on the opposite side of the men, as though it leapt clear over their heads, tearing at the face of the man formerly holding the lantern as it passed. The third and final vertebrae shows four men holding the creature restrained. Impressionistic lines, like the ghost outlines of hands reaching up for the ship, cloud the background, suggesting all hands on deck after being raised by an alarm. The creature's arms are pinned behind its back. The taut lines of its body imply motion, a struggle. At last the creature can be seen head on. The chest is flat, faint contours marking a dip inward at the waist. There are no sexual organs in evidence, although this may be a choice of modesty on the part of the artist, rather than a factual report. Diagonal slashes, heavily darkened with verdigris, suggest gills along the creature's sides or the extreme protrusion of its ribs. Its mouth is open, revealing rows of needle-like teeth. Aside from the creature, the clearest figure in the third piece of the triptych is the captain, marked by the fine cut of his clothes. He stands apart from his men, elevated on the forecastle deck, while the crew hold the creature on the main deck. A concentration of verdigris suggests the captain's face is largely in shadow, with stark contrast given to the whiteness of his eyes. The ultimate effect is a staring expression, the roundness of his gaze foreshadowing mania or obsession as it fixes firmly upon the creature. It is in the vertebrae triptych that the allegory of the sea's hunger 
begins to break down. The details are extremely specific. Perhaps the artist chose to give the capricious cruelty of storm and sea a concrete and monstrous form, or perhaps an inhuman being actually crawled from the sea and onto the deck of the ship. No written records from the Henry Charles Morgan remain to support either position. 5. Walrus Tusk, India Ink The length of this piece measures 20 inches, the entirety of it carved from base to tip. The scene is a rolling one, composed of several moments in time, marked by the phases of the moon etched in miniature above each instance. The work is extremely delicate, yet rich in detail. In total, the events depicted cover a span of just over a month. Beginning at the base of the tusk, the first moment shows only the creature's face, in close-up, struck through by bars, indicating imprisonment. The next scene shows the creature at full length, secured by a manacle about its ankle, although the face of the moon etched above it points to the passage of time. The artist still shows the creature's hair as ropes of wetness coiled against its skin. The pattern of scales is shaded more subtly. The gills are less pronounced. Accentuated, however, is the narrowing of the creature's waist, giving the illusion, at least, of the slight swell of breasts, and a roundness to the hips. The captain holds a lantern aloft to study the creature, a faint pattern of cross-hatching behind the captain, but separate from him, suggests a shadow watching from an unseen distance. The third scene depicts the captain's stateroom, a small table illuminated by candle glow and laid with a rich meal. The captain sits opposite the creature. Thick chains bind the creature about the legs and waist, but its upper body and arms are left free. Bones litter the plate in front of the captain, while the creature's plate remains full, piled high with food, untouched. The captain's expression is one of slack fascination. The creature is watchful tense, its mouth open ever so slightly to show the edge of its teeth. Next, three men, one bearing a bandage, partially covering his face, study the creature from a safe distance. Shadows partially obscure it. Perhaps it is a trick of the lighting which eliminates the curve at hip and breast, returning the creature to a more neutral form. Though the face itself is inhuman, the creature wears a very human expression. Hatred as it glares from its changed position at the watchful crew. Following this, the same three men are shown wrestling with the creature, then restraining and leading it by a rope. The creature's forward progress is ensured by means of a harpoon. A wound upon the creature's side, just below the slit of its lowest gill, leaks blood, highlighted by the artist through the heavy application of ink. The creature is next seen secured to the deck. Ropes binding each wrist and each ankle, holding its splayed. The wound upon its side is no longer in evidence, either sealed of its own accord or merely emitted by the artist. The three men stand with their heads bowed in conference. The creature's face is turned towards them, lips skinned back to show its needle-sharp teeth. A fourth man joins the scene. He carries a surgeon's kit. The bound figure of the creature appears smaller in this scene, more childlike in appearance, so the bonds remain tight. In the next vignette, the skilled hand of the artist manages to capture a keen intelligence in the creature's eyes, the growing unease of the three men standing watch, and the heart sickness of the surgeon at his work. Even restrained against the deck, the creature is imbued with a sense of watchful waiting, hatred rolling from its being in a way that is nearly palpable. Also palpable, even carved, is the fierce stench of sweat from the men. It is a remarkable achievement, and testament to the power of art, that it can evoke these sensations for all that it is only lines etched upon dead matter. Darkened by ink. The scene itself shows the surgeon cutting into the creature's flesh. The curve of what appears to be a rib bone lies bloody upon the deck. There is a gaping wound in the creature's side, and yet it unquestionably remains alive. 
In the next scene, the men are surprised at their ghastly work by the captain. His face is livid, brimstone and fire. The creature's lips show a hint of teeth, either a grimace or a smile. Next, the four conspirators are clapped in chains. They stand below the main yard, four sturdy lengths of rope descending from it, the end of which is done up in a hangman's bow. The conspirators' eyes are downcast, all save the surgeon, whose face is raised as if to implore God. The creature, unwounded, stands at the captain's side, hands unbound. A length of rope tied lightly about the creature's waist leads to the captain's hand. The final scene upon the tusk shows four men hanging from the main yard, bodies swollen with rot. Beneath this grisly frieze, the captain and the creature stand, facing each other, hands clasped. The creature is dressed, or clothing has been put upon it, a dress such as a modest woman might wear. The creature's shape, once again, suggests a shift to the feminine, though it may be the garments providing this illusion. The captain wears a look of rapture. On the part of the creature, no such expression is in evidence. 6. Substance Unknown The final piece of scrimshaw resembles the curve of a rib bone. It was found, along with the other pieces, in a canvas sack, likely made from sailcloth. The sack was found in a lifeboat, evidently cut free from the Henry Charles Morgan, and left to drift. This last piece in the collection is delicate in size, but sturdy in nature, harder than most calcium-based bone, carved upon none the less. It possesses a nacreous quality, its colouring a grey-purple sheen, like an oncoming storm. Where lines have been carved into the surface, the bone, if that is what it is, shows silver-white, like the old moon. The etching on the final piece is cruder, none of the artistry of the other pieces, suggesting it might have been rendered by a different hand. It shows the Henry Charles Morgan sailing towards the horizon, marked by the curve of the setting sun. Debris, including what appears to be human remains, litter the water in its wake, along with two lifeboats, one carrying three men, the other appearing empty. Of the Henry Charles Morgan itself, no further record exists. Both lifeboats eventually reached separate shores, one bearing a lone corpse, the other the canvas sack containing these six pieces of scrimshaw. The ultimate fate of the ship, the remaining crew, and their strange captive, or guest, remains unknown. I've been thinking a lot about perspective recently, the way that your view of a story or an event changes when your perspective changes, to be specific. Take The Prestige, for example. On screen, specifically, it's the story of two warring magicians and the two warring narratives that accompany the, the two men. Borden is methodical, precise, completely unable to remember the one thing that would redeem him. From his perspective, he is an underdog, a man mutilated by his increasingly deranged rival and whose life is dogged by his increasingly implacable foe, a man who outmaneuvers him at almost every turn. But from Dungier's point of view, Borden is a killer. Borden is negligent. Borden is a bad magician, and it's arguable that is the worst crime he could commit in the other man's eyes. Dongier is the one whose life is maimed by the loss of his wife. Dongier is the one whose career is forever tainted while Borden swans off to do parlor tricks. Why shouldn't he be better? What has Borden got that he hasn't? Why shouldn't he push through the limits of acceptable behavior and physical reality for the biggest trick of all? Two perspectives. One story the truth concealed somewhere in the middle. Or is it behind the rabbit, along with your card? AC does the same thing here, but I'd argue in an even smarter way, because the story begins with the benefit of academic distance. These are recovered artifacts. The events on board the ship have the comfort of distance, both temporally and geographically. They depict the final months of the crew's life, certainly, but those months are set, fixed, safe until they aren't. 
because slowly as we go through each one, the uncertainty the crew faces becomes something we face too. Was this supernatural? Was it a metaphor? If it was real, and there's a compelling case for it being so, then that opens up even more cans of weevil covered ship's biscuits. Did the creature take control of the captain, or worse, did it not? The horror of uncertainty becomes mixed with the horror of barbarity and the supernatural, and in the end all we're left with is a trail of wreckage and some pieces of scrimshaw. Oh, and the nagging sense to maybe not go out on the sea for a while, all because of a different perspective and what happens when we see it shift. Outstanding work. We rely on you to pay our authors and cover our server costs, and, well, honestly, all our costs. And there are really two ways you can do that. The cheapest one is to help boost our signal, raise our collective boats. There's all kinds of ways you can do that. If you liked an episode, tweet about it, or maybe write about it on your blog. If you have a podcast yourself, invite one of us on. We love being interviewed about this stuff. We're all massive nerds for it. Or leave a review on iTunes or Google. If you'd like to help out financially, then there are two ways you can do that. The first is go to pseudopod.org and click on Feed the Pod. There you'll be able to choose between donate and subscribe. Donations can be as much or as little as you want. Subscriptions start at five bucks a month and give you instant access to our magnificent bucket of premium content. Over on Patreon, you can do the same thing. We also have an exclusive Patreon audio show featuring myself and Karen Bove and my other drops around monthly. And the next one is about you. Regardless of how you'd like to do it, please help if you can. And if you can, please know you have our incredible gratitude. Pseudopod will be back next week when, as now, it will be a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, and no derivatives license. Your host, then, will be the mighty Alex Hoffelick, and the story will be The Harbour Master by Robert W. Chambers and read by the equally mighty B.J. Harrison. They'll see you then. I'll see you the week after. And I will leave you with this quote from Wilfred Wilson Gibson's Flannan Isle. And fallen dead by the lighthouse wall, and long we thought on the three we sought, and of what might yet befall. We'll be back next week, folks. See you then. It's a pseudopod. It's a big foot. It's all about podcasts these days.